Lecture 30, Teuton versus Roman. Thus the historian Tacitus, the Roman historian, paid to Arminius the highest tribute. The one man who defeated the Romans, not just in battle, but in war, and not in their early days, but in the high tide of imperial power. Tacitus tells us that uh, the Germanic singers of tales told stories of Arminius, but unlike King Arthur, Arminius did not attract a whole set of legends. There have been some attempts to connect him with Siegfried, the hero of the Nibelungen Lied, that masterpiece of German literature in the Middle, Middle Ages, but that doesn't really seem to be successful. No, Arminius just lived on in the pages of Tacitus. But Tacitus was discovered with new intensity in the age of humanism, in the late 15th century AD, when schools and scholars in Northern Europe, figures like Erasmus, turned their attention to the Roman classics in detail. And there, Germans found their national identity with Arminius. Germany itself was divided into a number of small entities. In 1517, when Luther nailed his theses to the doors at Wittenberg Chapel, uh, some 365 political entities comprised the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, as it was called. But there was Arminius. And it may even have been Luther who suggested translating his name into Hermann, so Hermann the German. And Arminius became a source of the mythology supporting the German Reformation against the corrupt church at Rome, as Arminius had fought for the liberty of a free and chaste and good Germany against the corruption of the Roman Empire. But what really put Arminius on the map was Napoleon. And Germany as a whole, and particularly the nation of Prussia, were, felt a deep humiliation at battles like Jena, when the Prussian army, so highly prized, was utterly defeated by Napoleon. And the very existence of Prussia as a kingdom was due only to the grace of the Napoleon. And the French began to import their ideals of liberty and equality and fraternity. It was then that Arminius began to be seen as the true model for resistance to the French. Uh, one of the poets of the time, Heinrich von Kleist, wrote a play, the Hermannschlacht. It appeals only to Germans, apparently. I don't know of an English translation of it. But in it, uh, Varus and the Romans are just pseudonyms for Napoleon and the French. And Arminius represents a revitalized Germany. And that is exactly what was happening in Prussia and all over Germany during these days of Napoleon's new empire. Uh, the Prussian government was reformed. The army was reformed. But above all, there was an intellectual revival represented by plays like the Hermann Schlock, represented by philosophers like Fichte and his addresses to the German nation, which stressed that Germany was unique, German culture was unique, and it had preserved its uniqueness against the forces of Rome, and it must now reassert itself against the new Rome, against France itself. And so from becoming, from, from being one of the most internationally minded of people, the Germans, they became during this rebellion against French ideals, uh, one of the most chauvinistic and nationalistic. And when Napoleon was finally driven into exile in 1815, this cult of Arminius and this cult of Germany as preserved free 
from the corrupting influence of Rome and of France and of these international ideas keeping unique unto itself. This cult of Arminius began to reach a flood tide when in 1870 and 71, Germany was united and the French Empire of the Third Napoleon collapsed. The newly united German government erected an enormous statue to Arminius. You can still see it today. It is near the town of Detmold, which is where the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest was thought by scholars in those days to have been uh, fought. Ah, and Arminius, rising up on this huge dome, his sword seven feet long, and on that sword is written, Deutsche Einigkeit, meine Stärke, meine Stärke, Deutschland's Macht. German unity is my strength, the sword, and my strength is German power. So the power of the sword. More recent scholarly excavations have determined almost certainly that the battle was not fought there, but not far from the town of Osnabrück, because large numbers of Roman military equipment, all from exactly the same time, and other evidence has established that that is almost certainly where the battle was fought, but that's of no real consequence. Arminius was the hero of the Germans. And in a less um, threatening fashion, there is even a statue to Arminius in New Ulm, Minnesota. The locals were referred to him uh, in a jocular fashion as Herman the German. And it was originally uh, sponsored by a German-American brotherhood called the Sons of Herman. So Arminius lives on, and it is a, certainly a fact, as Tacitus said, he kept Germany free from the Romans. There would be attempts, attempts by the Romans to regularize their frontier with the Germanic tribes. And you can take a most interesting, lovely, historically important drive all the way down from the Low Countries through German towns like Xanten on the Rhine to Cologne, which was a Roman colony. Its very name, Cologne or Kern, represents the German word Colonia. Down to Mainz, on around, following the course of the Danube now, the, to the city of Regensburg, on into Vienna, which was a Roman city and where Marcus Aurelius died in 180 AD, trying to hold back the flood tide of the Germanic invaders. The Romans called this the Limes, the frontiers, we might translate it, but it really is the limits of Roman power. And when you cross those limes still today into Germany, you're in a world that is different from France. The French became totally Romanized, the Gauls became Romanized. Caesar killed one million Gallic warriors, sold one million into slavery, and kept a million alive to become good Roman citizens. And by the second century AD, Gaul was a jewel in the crown of the Roman Empire. Its towns like the modern Orange, the seat of universities teaching Greek and Latin culture, the Latin language driving out the native Celtic tongues, the Gauls building towns just like the Romans with fora and wearing togas, and that is the difference. I think that this eternal struggle, now finally and hopefully ended, between France and Germany reflects the fact that the French took on the values and ideals of Roman civilization and the Germans retained that sense of uniqueness, that sense of un- tarnished, purity, honor, valor. And it made a difference right on down to the end of World War II. And under Adolf Hitler, this sense of German uniqueness took on the most grotesque and evil forms imaginable. The supermen 
who had once been represented by Arminius and his warriors. Now, the generations of German schoolchildren who read that the Roman Empire fell because of the Germans, that the Germans brought down the Roman Empire, were in a sense right. And it raises for us the question of why did the Roman Empire fall? We can talk even as one scholar did in the title of his book of the myth of Rome's fall and the numerous explanations that through the centuries have sought to explain why this great superpower fell. For Rome, in the age of Caesar Augustus, in the age of the Emperor Trajan and Hadrian, all through the first and second centuries AD, was the absolute superpower of its world. Indeed, it can even be argued that Rome remains the only absolute superpower in history. That is a power that is absolutely dominant militarily, politically, economically, and culturally. The Rome of Trajan, the Rome of Hadrian, dominated its world militarily. Even the empire of Iran dreaded Roman assaults. And the Germans, while they looked greedily across the Rhine, made no effort to cross into Gaul held back by the most efficient army in history. 360,000 Roman troops guarded this empire that stretched all the way from Britain out to the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys of what we would call Iraq today. From the North Sea to the sands of the Sahara. You would have to today pass through countries from the United Kingdom to Belgium and Holland on down into Luxembourg and through the western part of Germany, through Switzerland, Austria, Hungary, into Bulgaria, Romania, into what was once Yugoslavia, into Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, on into Egypt, on across to Libya, on across to Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and up into Spain. Now you'd have to change your currency, even in this day of the euro, a dozen times today. You would have to use a dozen languages if you were going to do it on your own, get all sorts of visas. And there would be parts of this empire, like Libya, where you might hesitate to travel even today. But in the first and second century AD, one language, the language of Latin, one law, Roman law, one currency, the Roman coin, carried you anywhere in that empire. St. Paul is the best tribute to the Roman peace and prosperity. He is arrested, and the um, officer who has arrested him threatens to give Paul a beating. And Paul says, you cannot beat me. I am a Roman citizen. I must have due process, and I have not been found guilty in a court of law. And the Officer demands to see Paul's papers and then says, How did you get to be a Roman citizen? I had to pay a big, I had to pay a big bribe to become a Roman citizen. And then later on, when Paul appeals to Caesar, to Caesar he must go, because that is his right as a Roman citizen. And indeed, the global economy of the Roman Empire, its global culture, made possible the spread in historical terms of Christianity. So dominant militarily, dominant politically, dominant economically. Rome and its economy was the dominant economic force all through Northern Europe and the Middle East, reaching all the way out to China and to Vietnam even. Roman coins have been found in Vietnam and Roman traders on a regular basis, went to India, bringing back spices. And culturally, the Romans had adopted the culture of the Greeks. And this Greco-Roman culture was fostered by the emperors. And the cultural unity of the Roman world, in terms of religion, in terms of philosophical outlook, 
in terms of literature read and the fact that Greek as well as Latin was known all over this empire. That too, from a historical point of view, played a major role in why the gospel of Christianity could be spread by Paul and the apostles and those who came after. A superb network of roads, a growing sense by those who lived in the provinces that they were citizens of this empire and they profited from it. And the belief of the Romans themselves that they were fulfilling the divine mission of Jupiter, which we saw in the Aeneid, to war down the haughty and raise up the weak, to conquer the cruel tyrants and raise up the weak and oppressed, that their task was a humanitarian one, to bring law and justice to the world. Why did that great empire fall? And Going back to St. Augustine, fine minds have grappled with this question. The Romans themselves, even in the time of Tacitus, were pondering whether or not their empire would last much longer. Some of them drew analogies to the human body that just wore out. Tacitus was more like St. Augustine, seeing in it a Fact that the, the fact that the Romans themselves were decadent morally and corrupt in terms of their ethics and no longer worthy of their greatness. And in more recent generations, there have been historians who said it fell due to lead poisoning. Somehow the Romans drinking out of lead vessels and having one of the best sewage systems the world has ever known, but using lead pipes all went crazy. I don't know how, quite how you explain the greatness of Roman culture with their all being insane, so lead poisoning. And now, one of the large trends, important trends in uh, the study of the Roman Empire and its fall is climactic change. We can study trees and other uh, indications to show that a climactic change, something like global warming, overcame the Roman Empire and it fell. Well, those are all nonsense. The Roman Empire fell, as all empires in history do, because of individual mistakes made by individual Roman leaders. Every empire has fallen because of critical mistakes. And the Romans made two critical mistakes, one in terms of foreign policy, one in terms of the economy. And notwithstanding his greatness as a statesman, Caesar Augustus made the first of these mistakes in foreign policy. He decided not to expand the empire. He made a peaceful solution with the Iranians, which left them on the border of the Roman Empire, near to major Roman sources of natural resources, such as the wheat of Egypt, with a large, technically superb army. And secondly, as we have seen, Augustus urged that there be no further expansion against Germany. And Tiberius ultimately agreed with that. And after 16 AD, there was no serious attempt to conquer Germany. It could be said that what was to be gained from pushing further into the forests and morasses of Germany, well, the conquest and reduction of the Germans themselves and the removal of that threat. And so it would be that the Germans and the Iranians continued to push upon the empire. And finally, when Rome itself fell victim to civil war and there was political instability in Rome, both of these forces, Iran and the Germans, made alliances and at the same time throughout the third century attacked the Roman Empire again and again. And by this time in the third century, 
Iran itself had undergone a religious fundamentalist conversion. It had taken back up its belief in one God, the God of truth, and the idea that the Romans were the infidel, the people of the lie, and that it was the God-given duty of Iran to conquer under the banner of the God of truth. Rome recovered by the end of the third century, but in such a fashion that it had transformed all of what made it efficient. The middle class had been the very foundation of the Roman Empire. And if you walk through towns like Pompeii, you see these beautiful homes built by middle-class Romans, well-educated, proud of their wealth, investing in the empire, investing in the free market economy. And they paid only, they worked only two days a year to pay their taxes. As we have said, the emperors understood that if you left money in people's pocket, they would invest it. You could go down to the equivalent of a bank and get 6% on a CD. Or you could invest in joint stock operations and make 12 times your investment. It was a time of social mobility in the first and second century AD. We know of, we know of numerous men who were born slaves, who worked, saved the small pittance that their masters gave them for carrying out a trade like being a cobbler, bought their freedom, and then became multimillionaires. There were also multimillionaires among the gladiators, and many of them, after they had bought their freedom, stayed on in the arena for the huge purses that they collected, and then invested in apartment houses. So social mobility, a wealthy middle class, that all changed in the course of this turmoil of the third century. The middle class now paid such enormous taxes that it was broken financially. The Roman bureaucracy, which in the heyday of Caesar Augustus or Trajan had been small and efficient, was now bloated with useless jobs. And to pay this bloated bureaucracy, Taxes had to be ever raised. Moreover, the army itself grew larger in the face of these foreign dangers, but more inefficient and more costly. And thus, the failure to take the aggressive action that Julius Caesar had wanted to take against the Iranians and against the Germans to conquer them and annex them brought this transformation of the Roman Empire into a totalitarian despotism where instead of opportunities, social mobility, everyone was tied to his job so that if your father was a baker, you had to be a baker. If your father was a farmer, you had to be a farmer. But I mentioned a second fatal mistake and that was economic policy. As long as, as long as the empire continued to expand, it brought in large amounts of money. The last emperor to be truly expansionistic was the Emperor Trajan from 98 to 117. He pushed across the Danube into the land we know as Romania today, conquered the Dacians, a fierce non-Germanic tribe, and brought back enough gold and wealth and slaves to give a stimulus to the Roman economy that carried it all the way till the reign of Marcus Aurelius from 161 to 180. But that stimulus was not repeated. Instead, the empire began to run into debt and to borrow money. And its debt reached such a crisis that when the third century came, and the Germans and the Iranians attacked, the Romans did not have the money. And they went to the most awful course you can take of devaluating your currency, essentially issuing fiat money, 
Money that has no value in itself, it represents only the government and the government's promise to redeem it. And thus inflation swept the Roman Empire so that prices in the third century rose by 10, 20, 100 times what they had been at the beginning of the century. Thus, fixed incomes were wiped out and one more enormous burden laid at the feet of the middle class. And the middle class perished. And as the middle class perished, so perished the Roman Empire. So that is how I view the fall of the Roman Empire. There's a lesson in it for us today. We have failed to solve the problem of the Middle East and of Central Europe. Just like the Romans, we began our involvement in the Middle East with an act of terrorism. That is what originally brought the Romans into the Middle East. We tried, as the Romans did, shock and awe, just beat down the forces that were opposed to us. Then the Romans went, as we have, to nation building. And finally, they went to annexation. And they were not welcomed as liberators in the Roman Empire. They met with revolt, like the great Jewish revolts. And ultimately, the Middle East became a quagmire. And the Germanic situation why, that is comparable today to our failure to bring Russia into the orbit of the free economic world. When communism collapsed in Russia, the Russians expected us to come in with something like a Marshall Plan, to build that country up as we had Germany on a basis of economic prosperity that would make democracy viable. We have left it with all the worst aspects of capitalism. And Russia, like Iran, is armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons, whatever we, we may want to think about Iran. It is chauvinistic, expansionistic, feels a deep humiliation at the loss of its empire. And Iran sees us openly as the great evil, the great lie, the great Satan. And in the midst of all of this, we have allowed our economy, once the all-powerful economy of a superpower, to become debt-ridden, widespread unemployment, and piling up for generation after generation vast sums, unimaginable even two generations ago, of debt and believing that we can continue to live with this enormous debt load. But don't worry. All things human pass away, just the way the Roman Empire passed away. But such was the Roman achievement, such was its legacy, that Constantinople, when Constantine converted to Christianity, built a Christian city, Constantinople would endure as an empire right on down until 1453. And indeed, the true legacy of the Roman Empire was, in historical terms, Christianity. And Constantinople, after the Western Empire collapsed in 476 to Germanic invaders, Constantinople would be the bastion of Christianity and of Greco-Roman culture. And even in 1453, when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks. The Sultan, Muhammad II, Muhammad the Conqueror, called himself the Caesar of Rome. And indeed, the title Caesar passed down into the European languages as Kaiser and Tsar. And the Tsars of Russia, when Constantinople itself fell, took up the title of Caesars, Tsars, and the myth was that Rome had fallen, Constantinople had fallen, but Moscow had now become the third holy city, and it would never fall. And in the West, Charlemagne would have himself crowned as 
emperor of Rome. Otto II in 962 would be crowned as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And Napoleon's army would carry eagles like the Roman legionnaires. And yes, the European Union, Union today, Europe has still looked back to that unity it had under Rome. And Winston Churchill foresaw that. In 1948, with Europe in ruins, he spoke in Zurich and said, I see a day when France and Germany will join hands and lead to the creation of a United States of Europe.